So sorry for the delay. There was a, an interruption because of the poor feed there. So now we will start. Good afternoon to all of you. So it is very difficult to take this online class after the heavy lunch that you and me both have taken. But uh, it's also very important to continue the process of this teaching and learning during this COVID era. In the last class, if you are able to refresh your memory, we are, just, we are talking about the biographical reels. In that, we have discussed all the biographical reels, six biographical reels, which were initially classified by Slater. And later one more was uh, added that is Oceania and when we have discussed about that. Now in biographical realms only one small topic that is left that speaks about the Valley's life. So it's a very interesting and uh, very peculiar area which is named after the great Jew geographer valleys. Most of the time we ignore valleys as a Jew geographer. When we talk about uh, valleys, we always think about the Darwin Valleys concept. Of course, basically Valleys was a Jew geographer. Based on his observation in the Jew geography, he could come out with the theory of natural selection. So now coming to what is this Valleys line? Valley's line is an imaginary boundary, remember. It's an imaginary boundary between the two important rims. One is the Oriental Rim and another one is the Australian Rim. So that's an imaginary boundary that exists between this Oriental Rim and Australian region. This line was proposed 19th century British naturalist Alfred Russell Valley. This line actually extends from Indian Ocean through the Lombok Strait. Lombok Strait is found between island of Bali and Lombok and that is named as Lombok Strait. So this line extends from the Indian Ocean, passes through Lombok Strait, then moves northward through the Makassar Trait. This Makassar Trait is in between Borneo and Celebes, both are islands. And then it moves down eastwards, south of uh, Mindanao and ultimately lands up in Philippine Sea. So this is an imaginary boundary. Uh, now Many Jew geographers consider this valley's line to be a regional boundary. No, most of them no longer consider it as a regional boundary. Uh, but what is the speciality of this valley's line? It does represent an abrupt limit, abrupt limit of distribution of many major animal groups, many fish and mammal groups. On one side, some of them are abundant. On the other side, totally different uh, species are abundant. So that's why uh, this uh, valley's line gains the importance. To give you, see, this is the photograph which you can see. Valley's line starts from this Lombok Strait and actually there are two Lombok uh, valley's line. One was named after Huxley named it, Meyer renamed it. See, it goes through Borneo, Borneo, then it Mindano Island, and then it goes and then turns little bit east. Uh, see, these are the area. This is the north of this. This is the Orientals, and south we have the Australia. In between, 
below that there is also one more line which you can see that has been marked with the red ball that is weber line actually uh, weber and welles uh, welles line encloses some area here which is the lot of islands are there and that is known as wallacea so the importance of this uh, wallace line is uh, it's an imaginary boundary drawn by the valleys between oriental and australia and this the northern side has totally different species composition whereas towards australian side it has totally different species composition so abruptly they change because in most of this uh, 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 where two biogeographical rims meet the condition will be little bit dif uh, different uh, they slow one rim slowly merges with the other one but here it is not the case uh, abrupt changes are seen here now let it be then uh, why it so that's a very very interesting thing there was one point of time in the geological time scale where asia and australia were joined together which i have told you while discussing the continental drift and this asia and australia together used to make one giant landmass uh naturally during this uh, period the species were free to move about in both the continents because it was connected by land and as a result of which what has happened they would remain as one singular species as they mated and produced viable offspring however once the continental drift and plate tectonics started to pull these islands apart where these two islands got separate two lands got separate what came a large amount of water that separated them draw evolution in different direction of the species because the species crossover was not possible was may not possible because of the washed expanse of the sea now uh the species evolved in different direction of the species kelta idya hello yes sir kelta idya yes sir yes sir screen on okay uh that uh what has happened now they are in a position to mate each other because there is a uh, oriental point india and australia got separated or uh, the asia and australia got separated in between there is a vast expanse of sea which is a barrier so then what has happened in both the rims the evolution continued independently in different direction and that made them unique to either continent after a long period of time has passed then later it has continued the reproductive isolation has also made one closely related species desperate and indistinguished that is the reason why there are drastic differences especially in uh, kalimantan and bali islands live animals such as tiger rhino elephants uh they are till now but due to human population expansion they are endangered uh but if you see sulawesi and lombok east of small moluccas island you find marsupials but in asian we in oriental rim we don't see the marsupials a variety of peculiarly looking monkeys and interesting endemic animals are seen in this region 
this valley's line close to that where we have valesia is a home to 697 bird species out of 697 bird species 229 that is almost 36% are endemic the rate of endemic will be still high if you consider only the resident birds 697 includes resident bird and migratory birds suppose if you consider only the resident bird then the endemism will be not 36% but it is 44% in uh, sulawesi island it's uh, neighboring islands there are 328 bird species 250 of them are resident and 97 species out of 230 97 species almost 36 37% are endemic among them one important one is the melio bird so if you consider valesia entire valesia it is having two two not one native mammal species where we have excluded uh, whales and dolphins whales and dolphins are excluded 233 of which are endemic see more than 50% are endemic if you exclude it out of this 201 81 bat species are there think that bats can fly from one place to another place uh, sometimes the barrier may not be effective for bats so if you keep uh, bats separate bat species separately the rate of endemism will be 93% and the la largest island of valesia is the sulawesi it has the highest number of mammals with 132 species of which 83 are endemic that is 63% is endemic uh, this valesia holds important flagship species no where you will find it that is anoas it's a buffalo it's a cousin our uh, buffalo cousin of our buffalo it's a diminutive buffaloes that live in the forests and one more very interesting pig babirula it's an um, unusual pig with long recurved upper tusks the speciality is the tusk grow down curve and then again pierces through the upper lip, upper lip and comes up it it almost it makes one round even the reptile diversity is also quite high uh, there are 188 species of which 122 that is 65% are endemic uh the best known reptile in valesia is one of the komodo dragon which is found in indonesia also komodo dragon is the heaviest lizard in the world uh, males can reach up to 2.8 meter in length and weighs about 50 kg they live in only one island what is known as the komodo island and the neighboring island padar and rinka to the west most of the 210 freshwater species recorded from the rivers of these islands and lakes most of them are tolerant to both and salt water to some some extent they can survive to a certain extent in both freshwater and salt water but still now not very clear more research is required and on Sulawesi itself there are 69 known species of which 53 there is 77% are endemic and lot of study is to be done in the Moluccas or Lesser Sundas islands about the fishes in the north eastern corner of 
Sulawesi Island. There is one lake that is Malili Lake. A it's a very complex of deep lakes, rapids and river. Here at least 15 endemic a very beautiful fisher that is uh, fisher that is telmateri with fishes they have evolved here only so the islands near this valley line are all collectively called by a name to honor the alfred valleys the valleys here why they are called all the islands in a, and around valleys line we call it as Valencia. Uh, all of them have a distinctive set of species in each island. Even the birds which are capable of migrating between mainlands of Asia, Asia and Australia seem to appear that they have become resident birds of that. And till now we don't know why they have not uh, moved, uh, because how they have become uh, the resident birds. Because uh, birds being the active flyer, they would have uh, visited Oriental Rim on one side and Australian Rim on the other side. But uh, we don't know. So this is um, about the valleys. Now, uh, with this, uh, I have completed. Uh, the study of this uh, biogeographical rims. Uh, so, uh, do you have any doubt? Already, Nano, either do write up Kalsi and Chiki the anime? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, including valence line, I have uh, sent the information. So, uh, actually with this we have completed uh, one topic that is the Jew geography. That is uh, starting from what we have discussed till today. started with the uh, uh, geographical distribution of animals and then zoo geography. In zoo geographical rim, uh, uh, we have zoo geographical rims and uh, the a brief account of valley's line also we have uh, completed. Any doubt? Yes, tell me. No, sir. Yeah. If not, I will immediately move on to the next chapter that speaks about wildlife biology. Okay? Okay, sir. Oh. Okay, sir. Uh, before going to the wildlife biology, I would like to ask you what is meant by wildlife? Yes? Really? What is wildlife? No. Really? Puja, what is wildlife? Vijay, Saundarya, just tell me what is wildlife? Sir, forests. Huh? Really, even if it is wrong also, no problem. Yarn and Taidri. Really? Sir, forests, wild animals. Forest animals, okay. So, the uh, animals, animals which are living in the all forest, we call them as wildlife. Okay, uh, it's good. Any other answer, Vijay? Vivek? Vijay, Vivek? Kelapa, Vijay, what do you mean by wildlife? Exactly, wildlife. don't know, sir. Huh? Hello. Exactly, don't know, sir. Huh? So, Sariya, Kyaatayla, Saundarya? 
Sir, it is an animal's house. Yes, tell me. Yes. Huh? Where animals live, sir. Wildlife. I am asking you to give me the information about wildlife. What is wildlife? Okay, Soumya. Soumya. What is wildlife? Animals living in the forest. Animals Plants. living in the forest. Okay. That's fine. Uh, I'm not... Kunit uh, and Nitish. Tell me what is uh, wildlife. Okay. Now... Uh, you say that the animals which are living in the forest are called as wild. Now I will ask you whether fish is wildlife or not. Yes? No, sir. Fish is not wild. Okay, if you see some uh, animals in the desert. Whether they are wildlife or not? No, sir. Sir, they are wildlife, sir. They are wildlife. But uh, many of you told that uh, the animals which are living in the forest. Okay, forget it. Whether a dog or a cow is a wildlife, is it? No, sir. Uh, no, sir. What are they? Sir, they are domestic, domestic animals. animals. Domesticated animals, isn't it? Yes, sir. Now, how do you define wildlife? Undomesticated, sir. Yeah, any organism which is not domesticated, we call it as wildlife, remember. Don't say that wildlife means... I know, when I say wildlife, you always imagine about elephant, tiger, uh, guar, lion, cheetah, isn't it? But the butterfly that you see in your garden also but a wildlife. Or the fish you, the, you catch in the uh, ocean and in the river also wildlife. So anything which is not domestic, any living being, anything means any living being which is not domesticated is wild. Is it clear? Yes, yes. Don't think that only those which are living in the forest are wildlife. Okay. Now, with this, we can think, now we can think about the wildlife. So, distribution of wildlife in India, distribution of wildlife in India. All of you know, India is a rich, biodiversity rich country and one of the mega biodiversity countries. When we say India is one of the mega biodiversity country, naturally there must it must be rich in wildlife. So in this chapter, what we are going to discuss is what is the beauty of wildlife in India? Or it should be able to give us a glimpse of wildlife only at the cursory level, remember. Because we cannot uh, take every wildlife and talk. Some of the major animals again we will consider and how they are distributed. So, wildlife includes all non-domesticated plants, animals and other organisms, isn't it? Even all organisms were wild ones. Domesticating the wild plant and animal species for the human benefit started long ago. And this has the effect all over the planet. 
and it has a major impact on environment both positive and negative so now where do you find the wild in india to put it in one word the wildlife can be found in all ecosystems that we have it can be desert it can be rainforest plains other areas including the most developed urban cities will also have wildlife all these such places have distinctive form of their own wildlife but unfortunately you must have read and heard most of the wildlife around the world is affected by human activities nowadays now coming to india the wildlife of india already i have told you india is a mega biodiversity country and it has two exclusive hottest hotspots of biodiversity in india and two more hottest hotspots of biodiversity we are sharing with other nations all together we have four hottest hotspots this to call this india as a mega biodiversity country naturally we should have the diversified wildlife and for your information the wildlife of india is a mixture of species of diverse origin what do you mean by this diverse origin all the species that we have here today they are not originated here only many of them originated elsewhere many of them have reached india when uh even before the continental drift even afterward also what has happened just if you are able to recollect when the continental drift started the land mass broken into two region one is eurasia and another one is gondwana india was a part of gondwana but again because of the tectonic plate movement this india from the gondwana broke off and moved toward the north and hit the eurasian plate where they where india hit the eurasian plate in asia that resulted in the formation of the himalayan mountain now see here three steps you can see first when the entire landmass entire world was single landmass there was the free movement of species then for many million years there was two separate land entities one is known as eurasia and another one is known as gondwana india was a part of gondwana as a result what has happened india shared many species of gondwana then again it hit back to eurasia and become a part of the eurasia again it uh, exchanged shared its species with the eurasia so that's why the wildlife of india is a mixture of species of diverse origin this has made india also very rich in rich and diverse in wildlife and india is also a home to number of rare and threatened animal species very rare and threatened species and that's why we have a wildlife management in the country which is very essential to preserve this species according to one study india along with mega diverse countries mega diversity countries it is the home to about 60 to 70% of world's biodiversity suppose even if you take india within the indo malayan eco zone or oriental ring indo malayan eco zone or oriental ring is home to about 7.6% of all mammals which are seen in the world 7.6% of mammals 12.6% of birds 6.2% of reptiles 
and even 6% of flowering plant species are found in India. It, I mean India means it is in the oriental region. Now, for the convenience of our study, in order to understand the wildlife of India, we, it is better to study the wildlife in different biogeographic zones. India is a very diverse country, which all of you know. Virtually we have every kind of biogeographical zones. We have desert, we have coastal region, we have mountains, we have snow laden mountains, we have evergreen forests. So, whatever the things you mention, it is found in India. So that's why, based on the, this one, we can divide our entire India into 10 different biogeographical zones. Based on climate, vegetation, altitude, and flora and fauna. What are those 10 zones? One is the Trans-Himalayan zone. Second one is the Himalayan zone. Third one is the Desert zone. Then Semi-Arid zone. Then Western Ghats. Deccan Plateaus zone. Gangetic Plain zone. Northeast, Northeast Indian Forest zone. Coastal zones and islands. There are 10 different biogeographical zones. As I, already, as I have told you, this division of India into different biogeographical zones is based on climate, altitude, weather condition, different types of ecosystem that they have, flora and fauna. So, we are able to divide India into 10 such different biogeographical zones. So for the very purpose of understanding the wildlife of India, we can take up each zone and try to understand about the wildlife in respective zones. So these are the different biogeographical zones. See, this is the Trans-Himalayan zone, this is the Himalayan zone, this is the desert, this is the semi-arid, This is the Western Ghats. Then this largest one is the Deccan Plateau. This is the Gangetic Plain. And uh, these are the coasts. And this is the Northeast. And then the islands. This is how we have divided India into different, 10 different biogeographical zones. So, if you want to see where are they, Trans-Himalayan zone refers to the upper regions of Himalaya and area is also given. When I say Himalayan zone, this is also a part of Himalaya but at the lower reaches, northwestern part or western, central Himalaya and eastern Himalaya. Then next one is the desert zone. In uh, Kutch, Thar and Ladakh area it is the desert. Central area, Central India, Gujarat and Ra Rajasthan everywhere, they are semi-arid. Western Ghat, you know, entire from Gujarat to Kanyakumari, the western coast, Malabar coast what you call, and including the Western Ghat mountain. Deccan Peninsula is the largest area. That is the all this Andhra part of Tamil Nadu, northern part of Karnataka, Maharashtra, all those things in the earlier photograph you can see. See, this is the entire this stretch is what you call the Deccan Plateau. The raw. Then Gangetic Plains. Upper Gangetic Plain and lower Gangetic Plain we call it. This is the upper Gangetic plain and this is the lower Gangetic plain, very close. Then Northeast India, all seven sister states, Brahmaputra Valley and Northeastern Hills, 
all the seven sister states what you call assam nagaland mega uh, nagaland meghalaya tripura uh, all those things uh, uh, comes under this uh, seven states of northeast india they comes under this northeastern india then islands islands especially the nicobar islands andaman nicobar islands and lakshadweep islands coast refers to the exclusive economic zone on both east coast as well as on the west coast see uh, this is again uh, state wise division i need not go there now let us start our discussion from trans himalaya that is again uh, if i want to show you this one this head part of jammu kashmir ladakh all those things comes under this trans himalayan which occupies about 3.3% area so this trans himalayan zone is estimated to be 186200 square kilometer area in the northern frontier so this himalayan mountain region is bow shaped and it is in the north west of india and virtually this entire zone in india is in the lahul spiti district of himachal pradesh and in ladakh and part of kashmir the mountains of this region have the richest wild sheep and goat community in the world this goat species and this area is known for the finest quality wool richest wild sheep and goat community in the world there are eight distinct species of sheep and goats and sub species are here vegetation is very less but grassland steppe grassland is there endemism is high many of the organisms which are in this trans himalayan zone they are endemic so they have the richest wild sheep and goat community in the entire world there are many herbivores like wild yak tibetan ass four horned antelopes and gazelles even uh, there are good number of carnivores also here like snow leopard because uh, this area uh, covers even the snow laden mountain part also tibetan wolf fox another animal that is a uh, royal spica there's one bird very distinct in this region is the black necked crane black necked crane is the most distinctive bird of this region so this term trans himalaya for a mountain range from north of indus then yarlang senangbu river was first used by alexander cunningham in his book ladakh in 1854 this word term trans himalaya was coined uh he has written a book that is ladakh in 1854 but it was sen hedin who popularized the name in this book the trans himalaya uh, where he documented the hidden exploration of this region from this book the term trans himalaya comes geographically speaking entire trans himalaya is made up of granitic and volcanic rocks which are formed around 120 40 million years ago these are the igneous rocks into the metamorphic and sedimentary rocks of the southern tibetan block also this 
Trans Himalaya, if you look into the political map or geography, divide to several areas. One is known as Koshista, Koshista, the west of Naga, Nanga mountain. Ladakh, between Nanga Parbat and <coughs> Korokoram, strikes slip fall. Then Kailash, Lhasa, that is in the southern Tibet, and Mishwe in the east. So this is, these are the geographical boundaries of this trans Himalaya. An extension of Tibetan plateau also comes under this trans Himalaya, where it has a sparse alpine population. Steppe, grass, alpine steppe vegetation. Steppe is a grass language with endemic species, lot of endemic species like ibex, snow leopard, black necked crane, marbled cat. This is another very interesting cat, uh, marbled cat, marmots, and it supports some of the biggest populations of wild sheep and goats. And it has uh, some very rare species of fauna such as snow leopard. Already told you, I have already told you, the black necked crane is one of the most distinctive bird of an impressive and distinctive avifauna. Uh, developed in lakes and marshes, lot of uh, aquatic birds also you can see. See, four horn antenna. This is the one royal speakers, Tibetan yak. These are some of the photographs. Sir. How they appear. Then, the next biogeographical reason is the Himalayas. Of course, all of you know the Himalayas consists of youngest mountain chains in the entire world. Having very good forest, very dense with extensive growth of grass and evergreen tall trees. Especially you can see oak, chestnut, pine, deodar trees in Himalaya. Vegetation is only up to snow line. What is snow line? The line beyond which the snow never melts. Under upper reaches of the for, uh, mountain, beyond which the snow never melts, that is known as the snow line. Up to there you can see vegetation but not above the snow line. Even it has several interesting animals. Chief species are wild sheep, mountain goats, shrews, panda, snow leopards are found here. So it's an important natural resource of the country, I should say. There are many endangered animals like Sikkim stag, maybe lost soon, even Thar or Kashmir stag also. So if you see this Himalayan zone, the wildlife distribution varies from very altitudinal. At the height of the mountain increases, the uh, composition of the wildlife changes. As well as if you move from east to west also, there will be a lot of changes. So that's why there are, you can make in Himalayan zone three distinctive sub zones with characteristic flora and fauna. That is Himalayan foothills, Western Himalayas and Eastern Himalaya. So this uh, Himalayan foothill extends from Eastern frontier of Kashmir to Assam. See, this is actually the Himalaya. And here, Western Himalaya extends from northwestern region of Kashmir, central region of Kashmir. And there are three zones of vegetation. One is uh, tropical or submontain region, uh, usually 1000 to 5000 feet above the sea level altitude. Here you can see the trees like Surya, Robusta, Dalbarja, Siso. Ficus trees are there. 
and isolated patches of grass acacia catechu toward the west there is a dry belt where you can see surya robusta is replaced by 059 gigipers acacia pinus then another one is the temperate zone so this temperate range zone from 5000 to 1000 11675 feet above the sea level vegetation is more coniferous forest rhododendron dwarf fir bamboos birch forest you can see dry areas close to punjab are cultivated and west areas uh, wet areas like uh, in kashmir rice is a major crop fauna usually consists of wild ass wild goat blue sheep hangul snow leopard wolf even tibetan antelopes birds like morals western tragophan ravens himalayan white crested khaliji these are common birds in alpine zone that is about 12000 feet the mean sea level plants are generally dwarf with cushion shaped shrubs and grass above 15000 feet plant growth is almost zero in the lower regions you can have rhododendrons junipers are found here then if you go to the eastern himalaya that is extending from sikkim to nepal northeastern frontier agency nepal that is all other uh, northeastern states vegetation is almost similar to that of western himalaya but there is a highest degree of tropical element greater variety of oak and rural dendron but less of conifers even eastern himalaya is divided into three zones one is montane zone above 6000 feet warm and humid weather is dense second one is temperate zone 6000 to 12000 oak dwarf bamboos then fauna red panda crested porcupines goat antelopes are there in alpine zone above again 12000 meters vegetation is there is a divide of trees only shrubs will be there so this surya robusta dalbadia this is a common one so if you look into the entire <coughs> himalayan mountain range this zone covers about 6.4% of total geographic area and virtually all type of forest alpine subalpine grassy moist deciduous actually more than 300 million population of indo gangetic plain depend on this himalayan water diverse habitat a range of species like hongols musk deer in the <coughs> you can also see in the if you come to the himalayan foothills big mammals like elephant samba swamp deer cheetal hog deer great indian one horned rhinoceros buffalo golden langurs you can see them even if you go to western himalaya wild ass wild goats sheep antelopes kashmir stag sikkim stag musk deer the animals of this western himalaya show more affinity with that of the mediterranean ethiopian and turkmenian region even the past presence in the region some of the african mammals probably at one time there were giraffes and hippopotamus uh, because we have could unearth the fossils of giraffe and hippopotamus in the shivalik range uh cold tolerant species evolved from wildlife tapis 
Elephants and rhinoceros are restricted to parts of Tharai region, that's the Putilefi mines. Now, even uh, Asiatic bears, clouded leopard, langurs, Himalayan goat antelopes, Indian rhinoceros, musk deer, many of them are facing the danger of extinction also. In eastern Himalaya, you have red panda, badgers, porcupines. The, east, the fauna of eastern Himalaya is almost similar to that of southern China and southeast Asian region. In the remote section of the Himalayas, higher elevation, you can see snow leopards, brown bear, lesser panda, Tibetan yak. and lot of insects, mites are seen in this region. Even fishes, glyptothorax is most of the Himalayan tree you can see there. And some of the blind snakes and butterflies of this Himalaya are extremely varied and beautiful. Um, the birds are very rich here like magpies, coughs, restarts, Lemingers, racket tails, beard vulture, black ear kite, Himalayan griffon, even up to elevation of 18,600 feet you can see them. So uh, here we will uh, end for the day. Uh, I hope I have taken uh, some 5-6 minutes extra because in the uh, middle there was some interruption. So, is it clear? Hello? Hello? Kya ta ita?